Please welcome Marta Figuerovich, a short history. Thank you very much, and it's so wonderful to be here again. Um, can everybody hear me in the back, you guys? Okay. If I start whispering, just let me know. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to first tell you a little bit about the book that this talk is part of. Then I'm going to give you some broad historical context into the history of what virality is and how people have studied virality in sociology and mathematics. And finally, I'm going to go on to think about how contemporary film tries to represent virality and how, in particular, contemporary film tries to represent the transition from kind of the old internet of the 90s, when networking still seemed like a good thing, to the contemporary internet, when a lot of us are both fascinated by the viral and a little afraid of going viral about something we might not want to slide our names under. Um, so in the book that this is part of called Mythical Thinking, I try to tread a middle path between negative and positive views of what the internet is doing to our minds. Um, there's a lot of writing out there that talks about how the internet is stealing our attention and making us more distracted and making us lose our memories. And on the other hand, there's also a lot of Silicon Valley propaganda about how the internet is making us superhuman in addition to the iPhone and virtual reality and everything else. Um, and I'm kind of suspicious of both perspectives, not least because even if we try to critique the internet, we still have to use Google to do it. Um, there's a kind of symbiotic relationship to these days between thinking, even critical thinking, and digital media. And this symbiotic relationship is what I try to think about. Um, so there are studies of this sort of older transitions between media. For example, people talk about how Plato is deeply influenced by the transition from orality to writing. How a lot of Plato is, a lot of the early Platonic dialogues are about an anxiety concerning what's going to happen to our memory now that we can write things down and what's going to happen to our sense of tradition. Um, and I try to follow sort of within that genealogy and tradition and think about kind of what aspects of our selves, of our qualities, of our intelligence do digital media enhance and which aspects do they diminish? Kind of how do they change the priorities that we have in how we represent ourselves and how we think about ourselves? And today I'm going to think about virality as one of the influences of the internet on our sense of agency and individuality and originality or uniqueness, as it were, or chosenness. And the story of virality on the internet, I would argue, is a story that begins in modernism and is the story of people's changing relationship to the notion of being connected. Um, so if any of you read British and American modernism, you'll know that connectedness is a very big thing. Um, Ian Forster has this novel called Howard's End, whose ma main character at one point says, only connect, only connect, and the beast and the monk, robbed of the isolation that is life to either, will die. And there's a little bit of irony to that in the context of the novel, because she doesn't actually manage to connect to people the way she wants to, but that quote has been taken out of context to encapsulate a certain late 19th century modernist ideology that is connected to globalization, the rise of telephones, telegraphy, new media. Basically, people came to notice that they were having a lot more encounters, random encounters with people from all around the world, and the world began to seem small to them. Um, you can notice this even starting in Dickens, whose novels depend on kind of everybody living in London and just bumping into each other. And this sense of contingency is represented as accidental, but also something that you can expect to happen. You're beginning to realize that the world is small enough that we're all somehow connected to each other. Um, this is something that Virginia Woolf also talks about, um, and also Conrad. And Conrad in Lord Jim begins to show you a slightly scarier aspect of this connectivity in which, as you might remember, 
Jim, the central character, continues to flee from one country to another as gossip spreads about this bad thing that he did on a ship some years ago. So even given those moments of ambivalence, we might say that there is an element of kind of extreme optimism to modernist talk of small worlds, as they call it. It seems that with our new media, with our new geographies, we can get to know many more people. And those encounters can create new forms of knowledge and new forms of sensibility that we might not have known about before. And the way Ian Forster talks about it is very significant. He describes it as the beast and the monk being robbed of isolation. So on the one hand, he describes connectivity as a kind of cosmopolitanism, a shedding of our barbarism. That is the beast in us, where we're afraid of the other. And on the other hand, he describes it as the shedding of the monk, so religion, and kind of religious traditionalist thinking, which this global world in which we encounter people from many different cultures and beliefs is supposed to get us out of. And what I'm going to argue is that it definitely seemed at first, and even into the early history of the internet, that this secularizing um, civilizing process is what the internet was creating. But virality was one of the moments of a tipping point where it started to seem that our excess networking was actually starting to bring us ever closer to the beast and the monk, to a kind of primitivism and also religious thinking in ways that are in fact very hard to get out of within our current network structures. Um, so how many of you know the phrase six degrees of separation? Yes, familiar. Um, so it's a phrase that's supposed to suggest that there are only six different people that separate us from any other person in the world. So like even if I don't know the president of America, I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows the president of America. And this is a pretty old idea and it has a very interesting history and begins in modernism um, with another writer, a lesser known writer than Ian Forster, um, the Hungarian Karinthi, the Hungarian Karinthi, who wrote a short story in 1929 called Everything is Different. And in this short story, he imagines people, this is a thought exercise, it's, it's supposed to be kind of speculative science fiction. Um, his characters are talking to each other and they're talking about how, oh, we have so many ships now and telegram and telegraphs and the radio. And one of us suggested performing the following experiment to prove that the population of the Earth is closer together now than they have ever been before. We should select any person from the 1.5 billion inhabitants of the Earth, anyone, anywhere at all, and he bet us that using no more than five individuals one of whom is a personal acquaintance, he could connect, contact the selected individual using nothing except the network of personal acquaintances. So in its original form, six degrees of separation is described as five degrees of separation, um, but it's described as a fanciful exercise that nobody could actually test, but that we can kind of dream about. Um, but then as a matter of fact, people did undertake this experiment. And the person who undertook it um, was Stanley Milgram. Do people know who Stanley Milgram was? He is more commonly known for his experiments on authority. Um, right after the Second World War, when people were trying to think about like, oh, how did fascism come about? How could Hitler have convinced so many people of an ideology that now seems so cruel and absurd to us? Well, maybe not now, but back in the 60s. Um, how could this have happened? And Stanley Milgram devised a series of experiments wherein an, the experimenter who was dressed as a scientist doctor figure was asking the subject to ele give electric shocks to somebody whenever they did an exercise wrong. It was a kind of simple math exercise. And the shocks were supposed to get progressively bigger as the person continued to make mistakes. Um, and the people participating in the experiment were told that the experiment was actually about the person doing the math problems. But obviously the experiment was about them, 
and about at what point they would stop shocking the person with increasing levels of electricity. And it turned out people were able to shock other people to deathly and above deathly levels at extreme percentages. And the experiment became very controversial. And in fact, he didn't get tenure at Yale because people had problems with it. Um, but it became this symbol of 60s experiments on authoritarianism and trying to figure out why sociality is bad. So after he did that, and it didn't turn out that well, he decided he wanted to do an experiment about how we all love each other. And that became the experiment on six degrees of separation. Um, he undertook it in 67, a couple of years after his big authority experiments. And what he did was send, give people letters. He decided to give letters addressed to a certain lawyer in Boston to people all around America. And he told people all around America um, to hand those letters. They had to be handed in person to somebody whom they also knew by name, who they thought might be more likely than they were to know the lawyer in question. And Milgram found that a surprising number of letters did reach the lawyer in that way, and that the number of connections needed on average is between five and six. So in a very surprising way, which nobody saw coming, he proved right this weird modernist story from 40 years back. So like all Milgram experiments, this experiment had a lot of problems in it. Milgram did not disclose that a lot of letters actually did not reach the lawyer at all. A lot of people just refused to participate in the experiment. And he also didn't talk about how there was actually a huge differential in the number of links required. Some people actually knew the lawyer directly. Other people needed like 30 links. So in terms of science, it was not excellent science, but it was very memorable science. Um, because it showed an America that at the time was still segregated in the middle, in the midst of civil rights movement and kind of class warfare. It showed America that actually people from all walks of life and from all different geographies were closer to each other in terms of social networks than they thought they were. And it got people thinking, like, how can this be? How can it be that in a society of many millions, there's actually such short nodes of connection linking all of us. The importance of this experiment grew with another important paper by Ma Mark Grenovetter, um, published in 1974, which was called The Strength of Weak Ties. This was a breakthrough article in sociology in which he was the first to show that those weak social ties of the kind that can like, allow you to transfer a letter to somebody you know are actually very important to things like making it in the world, making a career. The second experiment consisted in interviewing people who had recently gotten a job and asking them, how did you get this job? How did you hear about it? And it turned out that people, it was very rare that people got a job through like say their dad, because that's awkward. Like that's seen as unethical. But it was very, frequently the case that people got a job through the friend of a friend or a cousin who knew somebody's dad. So people would usually network with each other based on connections that were a little further off so as not to seem like nepotism, but were still about kind of how, who knows each other and what the social ties existing in society are. And this was a huge experiment following Milgram's because it showed that not only is the world of America a relatively small world, socially speaking, but it's through those social networks a lot of things get done. Um, it took another 50 or so years for somebody to figure out how it happens mathematically, and I'm not going to get into that in detail. Um, and basically the purpose of this graph, which was an important article in Science in 2003, is to show that if a network, even a very clustered network, say a network where most groups stick to each other, even if there are a few small nodes linking people randomly, 
this network suddenly becomes a small world of the kind that Milgram observed. So even if our societies are pretty hierarchical and pretty structured, the small world effect still holds within them. And this research was done, as you can see, as the internet, and the internet of social media in particular was starting up. And it was part of an important kind of ideological wave of of people figuring out what to do with the internet and trying to narrate kind of what are the scales that you can get out of the internet? What are the kinds of societies you could and should build within it? Um, and at the time, these kinds of experiments we used to think about kind of theories of networking, networking in business circles, but also on Facebook and LinkedIn, is very positive things. Um, they were made to seem, to, to suggest to people that our world is getting smaller, that we can know people all over the globe by representing ourselves well on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter. We can get a worldwide audience and we can reach kind of as much of the world as possible in a way that seems very democratic and initially at least seemed like a kind of grassroots movement where a person can speak up and those nodes are going to transfer that information to whoever needs it. Um, but all of that began to change when virality entered the picture. And virality entered the picture only a few years later. The first kind of real viral video appeared on the web in 2006 on YouTube. And it was soon thereafter in 2007 followed by the first star who was born viral, Justin Bieber. Um, it's amazing to think of him as part of that history. Um, but even so, in that early moment of virality, people were still optimistic about it. They thought, okay, so people are just like choosing what they like. And so what if people sometimes like stupid things? It doesn't hurt anybody. Well, soon thereafter, virality began to hurt people with kind of viral shaming and trolling and people like Trump. And people began to realize that actually the small world effect that is created by network is a kind of tipping point where when something goes viral, it's as if you were suddenly talking in a whisper and somebody turned on a microphone. It's not a kind of proportional democratic event. It's more like a lottery ticket, except one you don't always want, where suddenly something you said is being broadcast worldwide, and neither you nor the people doing it have much control over what is happening. Um, and people found out, moreover, that the, and this is from another article by Watts, um, the same person I just quoted. So people initially thought that virality would be a kind of proportional thing, meaning kind of the more tweets there are, like everybody gets more tweeted more often. In fact, that's not the case. Kind of in most human networks, there are people who are more connected and people who are less connected. <coughs> And the number of people who are very well connected, what Malcolm Gladwell calls connectors, is always very, very small. Um, and that effect is enhanced in a way that I'm not going to get into, but I'd be happy to in the Q&A, by the structure of search engines, which churn out results based on the highest number of connections to the results pre-existing, thus kind of reinforcing that dynamic, which means that virality is a very rare phenomenon, and it's a phenomenon that becomes rapidly oligarchical. It means, what I mean by that is that I can't make anything go viral. The only entities that can make something go viral are entities that are already internet institutions for whatever reason. So say if the New York Times tweets something, or if Trump tweets something, it can become viral as opposed to, say, my or your tweeting something, which is more like a lottery ticket. It's like, it might become viral. You might not want it to. <laughs> you might not think it will. Um, but the only reliable predictor of that kind of popularity is kind of oligarchical support. 
So I wanted, I wanted to show you guys all of this to lead into a discussion of how cultural phenomena, how film in particular tries to respond to it. And I'm interested in particular in how films try to represent that shift from what seemed like good connectivity, like overall interconnected, this is going to be great, to bad connectivity. Um, kind of, we are now in a network that we cannot control, which produces those huge oversized results occasionally, but then usually silences us for most of the time. And the first wave of films I began to think about were popular films. Um, horror films like World War Z, there came to be a slew of horror films whose premise was that if you're not very, very quiet, a lot of zombies or monsters are going to come and eat you, um, which felt like a direct, and here this is a famous scene from World War Z where people are starting to sing a song across the wall and that gets a bunch of zombies to come climb the wall and kill them. Other, obviously, virality-based films are Gone Girl, The Hunger Games, or A Quiet Place, my favorite, where unless you're very, very quiet, you will be eaten again. And all of those films are primarily fear-based, and they're based on a fantasy of being able to somehow control virality, either through radical privacy, as in the case of this one, or World War Z, or, as in the case of Catherine's Everdeen, by manipulating your own virality in a particularly skillful way. Um, so I focus on these films both because they show the fear that virality incites very transparently, but also because you know, I, am not, I want to signal the difference between these representations where it still seems possible to wrest control of the viral in this kind of fantasy space and the films that I'm going to get to in a moment in which that can no longer be done. Um, and part of what's very interesting to me about these other films, which I'm about to tell you about, is how complicated are the new theories of agency in society that you have to develop once you no longer trust in the modernist belief that connectivity is good and we're all interconnected. Um, now, has anybody seen this film, 20 Feet from Stardom? One person, thank you. Um, it wasn't a very popular film, ironically. Um, but it did get an Oscar. And if you get the chance to see it, it's a fascinating documentary. It's a documentary film that follows the lives of the chorus women of famous rock singers. Um, so these are the women who sang the female chorus in Give Me Shelter, the famous Rolling Stones um, hit single. Or these are the people who sang the opening of The Lion King, the part in Swahili. And if you wouldn't know who that is, it's the people who made this documentary. So it follows people who have become somehow famous on the fringes of stardom but who never managed to cross over into stardom. And the film begins with a premise that it isn't able to fulfill. It begins with a very optimistic premise, suggesting that this woman you see on the poster, um, whose name is Judith Hill, she's in the middle right there in between two older singers, might be able to break through this pattern. And the film hopes, as it begins shooting, that she's going to break through this pattern through virality. Um, so what happens is, shortly before she gets to be interviewed here and included in this group, she performs a cover of a Michael Jackson song during a tribute after Michael Jackson's then recent death. And her performance goes viral. And as the film begins, she's being interviewed as the one person who might be able to break out of this pattern thanks to democracy and the internet. But then the film sort of continues to break down a little and then becomes self-conscious about breaking down because it turns out she actually, nobody knows how to 
profit from this moment of virality. She does get an album, but then the album falls through because her manager is kind of inept. And meanwhile, a series of trolls starts following her, and if they don't like a song that she's playing, or they don't like, say, like her doing a chorus and something, they become very vocal about it on the internet. So kind of she becomes hounded with this ghostly presence of internet spectators without actually getting any fame out of it. And meanwhile, the film kind of continues to interview all the other women who did not become famous and basically explores different reasons why they didn't become famous when it seemed like they wanted to. And some of them describe it as institutional racism, which it also was. Others see it as kind of their lack of charisma or they're preferring a calm family life. There's kind of a number of reasons being cycled through. But none of those reasons becomes sufficient. Um, and none of them really lingers to explain Hill's particular situation of both extreme visibility and extreme disempowerment. And finally, towards the very end of the film, Hill begins to sing this song. Um, and I'm going to give you a moment just to look at it. Can you see it? Yes, sort of. So this is a song that is the hit single on the album that she hopes is going to make her viral again for a second time, and which fails to do so. Um, and it's a song that's literally about being called out into stardom, and then wondering whether your calling is a true calling. And part of what I love about this song is it's extremely religious. I mean, it's obviously secular. There's no God mentioned. But the notion of being chosen to be a star is represented in terms of, like, maybe this is what you're supposed to be doing. Like, you have your life, and you have to express your life. And perhaps your desperation is going to get you fame. But maybe it's not. But this is a song which, in the midst of kind of American individualism and expressivism, begins to introduce this element of kind of fate, of acknowledgement of how completely random viral events can start to seem to us. Um, and part of why I love this is because it's a kind of godless religious song. It doesn't know what the authority is that it has to appeal to, but it begins to realize that within its network system, the kind of hyper-individualism that's supposed to guarantee you, like your originality, according to the American dream, is what's supposed to guarantee you fame. But here, instead of originality, you get this return to the Protestant notion of chosenness and selection by God. And paradoxically, kind of given the structure of virality and the individual's relationship to on, on the internet, that's a surprisingly accurate representation of your degree of agency on the internet. Where in a weird way, it's not that you're falling into a belief system to prevent yourself from living in a contingent world. You're falling into this religious structure to explain to yourself how contingent is the world that you've fallen into. Um, and this religiousness continues to come back in the representations of virality. As I said, it's a kind of godless religiousness. Um, but it's an attempt to yeah, basically represent disempowerment in a way that also acknowledges a certain kind of structural condition within which the disempowerment comes about. Um, and the second film to which I wanted to draw your attention, which I hope a few more of you have seen, is this film, Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri. Anybody? OK, OK, good. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen it, um, this is a film which was made by Martin McDonough. And it's about a woman named Mildred, here's Mildred, um, played by the same actress who plays the famous uh, policewoman in Fargo. And she's this kind of hard-boiled, farmer-type, rural American person. 
and her daughter is raped and killed right outside of Ebbing, her hometown in Missouri. It's a fictional town. And the police are not able to locate her killer, and Mildred believes they're not trying hard enough. So to make her point heard, she rents out three billboards, of which you see two in this shot, and she tries to provoke the police in her hometown into doing something about this open case of her daughter's murder by having those billboards posted right outside of town. And the plot that follows involves kind of escalating mutual threats. Eventually, she burns down the police station. And then at the end of the film, spoiler alert, uh, she makes friends with this very racist, kind of not very intelligent policeman. And together, they go to another state to find not the rapist who killed her daughter, but another person who they also think is a rapist. Um, so kind of they go in search of a type, not of the individual. Um, so this film has mostly been discussed and criticized as a kind of realist portrayal of American, as it's called, flyover country, of kind of the American rural countryside. Um, and I, I agree the film doesn't have much to offer in those realist terms. Um, it's not the kind of updated Fargo that Francis McDormand's presence might suggest. Um, but instead, it's a very powerful film, especially about the notion of networks and the notion of kind of what is local and what is global and what does it mean to live in a world that is supposed to be very easily searchable in a small world, but turns out to be kind of unexpectedly vast and cavernous and full of kind of things that you cannot locate within it. Um, and to give it this alternative reading of Three Billboards, I'm going to start by discussing a short story um, around which this film constantly orbits. And this story is Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find. Have people read that? Um, so w there are a few direct quotes of the story in the film itself, most particularly one of the characters, um, Red Wilby, is seen reading Fl Flannery O'Connor in one of the crucial scenes. Um, and critics have noticed those parallels before me, but they have tended to represent those parallels. This is a kind of representative review that invokes them it tends to represent them to hint at kind of the possibility of grace within an otherwise bad environment. Um, so one way of reading Flannery O'Connor is as this like, very dark, gothic American writer whose characters occasionally redeem themselves through kind of God's grace or some good deed that they do. Um, and a lot of critics have seen this parallel as hinting that we are to read Mildred making friends with this policeman and the police eventually helping her is such an act of grace. I don't agree with that, um, but I do think that the story is very important to this film. But it's important to the film because as a late modernist story, it falls in with Joseph Conrad's similar suspicion of modernist speed. Um, and as I'm going to try to show you, both A Good Man is Hard to Find and this film are actually kind of frightened about the possibility of the disappearance of the local and of the impossibility from transitioning from a literal village to a global village. How a lot of knowledge is actually lost along the way. Um, so again, have you, who's read A Good Man is Hard to Find? Okay. I'm going to tell you what it's about. Um, and you should read it. It's a really good short story, even if I tell you the ending, which I'm about to do. Um, so it's a short story told from the perspective of a grandmother. The grandmother is in a car with her son and her daughter-in-law and her um, grandchildren. Everybody kind of hates the grandmother. She's really annoying, um, but she doesn't realize it. And they're in the car. They're trying to drive to another city, and while they're driving, the grandmother seems to remember that if you take a particular turn down a road, they're going to get to a little farm that's from her childhood, like a little place that has nostalgic value for her, and she persuades the family to go down that road. 
And of course, that's not actually the road that she meant because she doesn't understand how fast cars go, and they're actually many miles further away from this, her home city than she thought they were. And meanwhile, they've been hearing on the radio, kind of as they're getting lost and driving around the countryside, they've been hearing on the radio about this guy called the Misfit, um, who is a killer and a gangster, and who's on the loose, and the police is trying to find him. Um, they're, they have an accident, they're by the side of the road, and the car stops to help them. And the person who stops to help them happens to be, you guessed it, the misfit and his crew. And the grandmother foolishly rec says to the man that she recognized him. So it's like, oh my god, you're the misfit. I just heard about you on the radio. Um, and then he just kills the entire family. Um, so there's that. But it's actually very good to read, if, even if you know how it's going to end. So I hope I haven't destroyed your life in that way. Um, but throughout the film, kind of one of the reasons why the grandmother has to be the narrator, kind of it couldn't be a child who's being so foolish, is because so much of the film is about how new all of this technology is. Kind of they're listening to the radio, and it seems that they're getting news from all over the world, and they're going so fast. And the grandmother keeps marveling at kind of how small the world has become. And then it's this small world that kind of sucks them in. Because she thought, do you have a hand up? Okay. Um, because she thought that they were going to, like whoever they were hearing about on the radio must be hundreds of miles away, because I guess the radio is the metropolis. But actually, he's right next door. Just as she thought that they were still in their home village, but as a matter of fact, they're already hundreds of miles away from it. Um, so it's all about how this new mode of travel, which makes you more networked, also makes you feel much more confused. And it also reduces everything around you to a type. So instead of having the turn in the road that used to go to her home farm, she starts to recognize a particular shape of curve, which is actually appears a lot on that road, as it turns out, which is why she makes that mistake. And the title of the story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, comes from the way that when the grandmother is pleading as he's like begun to kill a family, first he begins with the members of the family she doesn't like as much, but then she, he gets to the ones she does like, and she starts pleading with him. And she says, you're a good man, like my son. And she starts to use this typology of good man, which begins to collapse basically all of the male figures in the story into this one category. Um, so Flannery O'Connor is representing here a certain kind of slippage which comes from seeing and knowing too many places where you stop to see the particular stop seeing the particularity of things and you begin to see everything as a type of itself or as a kind of vague instance of something. Um, and I want to argue, or I want to put it to you that this is the mechanism that three billboards in Ebbing, Missouri is also very interested in. It's interesting in this passage from the small world of the fictional town of Ebbing to the large world of the police network of registered sexual offenders and advertising systems. And in making its networks seem relatively retrograde, kind of nobody uses the internet here, they just have billboards and I think there's one computer at the police station. It's nevertheless making the point that you cannot quite get there from here, that the small world of the village is different in extremely crucial ways from the typological small world of a global system. So when you begin watching this film, the first thing you notice is the small town vibe. So everybody knows each other. Um, whenever Mildred yells at anybody, everybody else knows. She um, she wounds the dentist and the police come to her almost instantly being like, why'd you do that, Mildred? Um, everybody knows the details of how her daughter was killed. Everybody knows also that Chief Willoughby, the policeman against whom Mildred is standing up, is dying of cancer. Um, there's also the kind of funny language infection going on if you watch the film closely where 
whenever when characters use certain words, especially swear words, they continue to get repeated over and over again. So there's a very funny scene where kind of everybody says fuck at least like five times. Um, and all of this makes the film seem to take place in this very tiny closed community. And at first it makes it seem as if this community has to be hiding a secret. If, given how small it is, they still haven't been able to find a rapist. And within this small community, Mildred essentially tries to instigate a small instance of virality, by kind of putting up those huge billboards and shaming the chief. But what happens instead, and then kind of she escalates this by literally setting the police uh, station on fire, as if to kind of li literalize that sense of urgency. But what happens instead is, it turns out people in this town actually know far little, far less than they thought they did. And the more she looks into the plot, the more it turns out that at crucial moments, both in her own life and in the life of the daughter, there were actually no witnesses. And there are no traces of what had happened to them which sometimes allow Mildred to get away, like that's how she gets away with um, burning the police station. But that is also one reason why nobody can find her daughter. Kind of the, the world of this village is paradoxically too big. It's big enough for people to be alone in it sometimes. Um, and it's a world that's big enough. For her to also eventually decide, as she cannot find the rapist that she wants to find, both she and the other characters begin to think about this crime in typological terms. Um, so this begins with Chief Willoughby, who as he's dying of cancer, begins to pronounce very abstractly about like, love and suffering, and he writes everybody those gorgeous letters, telling them how much he loves them and how they're special, and he knows they can be good people. And in response to those letters, instead of letting go of their particular cares, the characters adopt a similar abstractness. And Dixon, the racist police officer, and Mildred eventually team up. And so they, find, they have a kind of red herring. They find somebody in a bar who has been talking about committing rape. And initially, they think that this might be the rapist they're looking for. But then it turns out it isn't. But they decide to kill him anyway, because he's, he's a rapist too. Um, so the film kind of does this substitution, which I argue is kind of paradigmatic of the kind of vile substitutions I was talking about earlier, where instead of trying to find some particular thing, you resort to the next best thing, which is finding a type which is close by and which is easily searchable. And the film represents this as a very, like obviously a scary resolution what kind of not only are you going to do take justice into your own hands, you're not even going to um, do justice to the person who killed your daughter, but just to some other random act of injustice. However, it also represents the alternative to this as equally frightening, because the alternative to it, as Mildred suggests in talking to Willoughby, is this completely totalitarian system of control. So this is early on in the film where Mildred is asking Willoughby why they haven't found the rapist yet. And he says, well, we do have some blood samples, but the person is not anywhere in the police archives. Kind of, they haven't been convicted of a crime before. And Mildred said, well, why can't federal government do something about it? Can't you guys just pull blood from every man and boy in this town over the age of eight? Or from every man in the country? So she says, given that we have so many technological capacities, why? can't we make the world even more searchable? And Willoughby says, no, we definitely can't do that. Um, so similarly to 20 Feet from Stardom, which kind of gives you the alternative of, kind of false hopefulness and this kind of religious thinking, this film also positions you in between two alternative ways of approaching this kind of phenomenon of huge networks neither of which is quite comfortable. We're kind of one of them is this notion that we no longer care about particulars, we're just going to stick to types. And the other one is this notion of 
what if we just gave all of our information to the internet? And then the internet would always yield the right answer. Um, and I want to suggest to you that the politics of this dichotomy are very strange. Um, because instead of, you know, we're no longer thinking here in terms of a democratic agency and self-expression. We're thinking here in terms of kind of searchability within networks that you decide a priori. You are too small and too individual to negotiate and figure out on your own. Um, and it's a film which in both cases, because both solutions also are sort of utopian in the sense of resorting to something that seems more like an impossible ideal than an actual solution. Um, and in that sense, both also, I would argue, suggest that part of what virality is doing is also forcing us to try to imagine kind of new dreams and new fantasies of the perfect society within which this virality could somehow be harnessed. And whereas films like The Hunger Games try to represent those utopias in ways that ultimately turn out for the good, um, these films that I tend to like better, which are more ambivalent, represent them as those alternatives between which we kind of see the depth of our ignorance and see the depth of the division that separates, say, the way you can know a small community in a little town and the way Google allows you to know your friend network by typing in names or typing in particular types. Um, and here I'm going to pause and I'll let you guys have questions. <laughs>